Okay, so I'll try again. Okay, sorry for having uh, missed that part. Okay, so as I was saying, the message I want to convey is that uh, deep learning is, is doing great, but has certain troubles, okay, with the structure out of distribution generalization. And that normally sort of uh, people look into the idea of inductive biases, but in the deep learning setting, the inductive biases are no more that intuition. So the proposal is to, to learn languages, okay, with the semantics, and uh, and this in some sense what I'll try to do. Uh, I was mentioning, okay, there was this talk by uh, Joshua Bengio uh, on system two deep learning. And in this, and the abstract actual of, of this talk, uh, Benjo says that systematic generalization is hypothesized to arise from efficient factorization of knowledge into recomposable pieces corresponding to reusable factors. So in a sense, my point is that these recomposable pieces uh, should be learned in the language and that recombination and the generalization will follow from the semantics, okay? So this is all very much in line with traditional AI as well. Yet the implication of this idea has not been, okay? So have not been sufficiently explored in, in my view. So a little bit the plan for the talk is to start with an example, okay? Because my point is not a philosophical point, but a technical point. So I want to illustrate well in an example. Then we look at some specific languages, okay, that people have considered in learning and in, in AI in general, okay, structural causal models and, and planning languages. Uh, then the idea is to relate this a bit to some of the threats in, 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 uh, in the sub-communities that come in here, and then focus on representation learning in the setting of action and, and planning, in particular the problems of learning general dynamics, not okay, uh, uh, tailored to a specific domain, general, learn, uh, general policies, not tied to a specific state spaces, and general uh, sub some call structures as well. Okay, so there is a paper uh, okay at the bottom. Um, uh, you can get it and you can find all the references. Okay, I'm not going to be cluttering up the slides with too many references. Okay, so here we go. So this is an example uh, I've taken from the literature on, on deep reinforcement learning. Is the so-called mini grid environment or environment used in the baby AI paper a couple of years ago. Okay, it shows a grid with an agent that is the triangle in red, and this agent is supposed okay to get certain keys, uh, to open certain locks, and then uh, in that way to go through certain doors in order to achieve different goals. So okay, the goals are expressed in a uh, grammar, a formal grammar. So a uh, particular task may be so pick up the gray box behind you, then go to the gray key and open uh, the door. Uh, the task is, is difficult. So basically, so uh, the, the task in a deep re reinforcement learning setting is to learn a controller that will accept uh, the goals and the observations, what the agent can see, and at each step can help with the action uh, to do. Okay, for those of you familiar with the classical planning, okay, actually there are classical planning benchmarks that have this exact form uh, the big difference okay is that the dynamics of of um, this environment is not known to the agent a priori and the goals are supposed to be achieved reactively not by planning okay through this type of closed loop policies actually so the, the fact that you know so little about the environment is what it makes it okay particularly hard and um the surprise is not so much, okay, that deep learning and deep reinforcement learning struggle in simple toy environments like these, but that they actually manage to get some meaningful behavior at all, okay? So probably one of the um, main shortcomings of, of, of this approach is the methodology. The methodology is mostly ad hoc, okay? You read the papers, Normally, so the first page is the intuition, second page uh, is the architecture, third page, okay, are the experiments, okay, in comparison with baselines. But in some sense, this is not entirely satisfying because doing better than the people that came before, okay, is not necessarily um, providing us into an understanding of what the problem is about and what the solutions are about. So you may be cleanly higher, but in the wrong tree, okay? So on the other hand, if you take the perspective that we should be learning uh, representations based on languages uh, within known semantics, so the two immediate questions, okay, that arise and are very precise and are technical questions is what are the domain independent languages, 
for representing the general dynamics of these type of domains, for representing general policies in this domain, for representing the general subgoal structures, okay? So the fact that you need the key in order to open a lock and then a lock in order to open a, a, a door and things of that sort, okay? So the first question is, what are the languages, okay, to represent um, dynamics, policies, and sub goal structure? And the second question, of course, is how to go about learning the representations over that languages. In a certain way, the challenge in language-based representation learning is to learn from data what we traditionally, we used to write by hand, okay? So this is more or less what we want to articulate and to and to address. Mm, fortunately, in AI, we know quite a bit about representation languages. There has been uh, a thread, a research thread going on for many years about uh, solvers. So there are solvers for SAD, basic network, structural causal models, classical planning, MDPs, POMDPs, okay, you name them. And in all these solvers, basically, they accept descriptions, compact descriptions of the models that you are supposed to solve, okay? So you give a solver uh, a problem in a certain language that normally is exponentially smaller than the state space of the problem being represented. And uh, the solver is supposed to come up with an output that depends on the nature of the problem, okay? What is common about all these languages is that these languages are not tailored to a specific task and domain, so they are domain independent, okay, for this particular class of, of mathematical models. So there are two things uh, that motivate the use of languages, okay, for specifying these models, in particular in the case of planning, or so in factor, uh, POMDPs of first order, even MDPs and so on. So one is the compact model specification, and the other is efficient computation, because sometimes the languages make certain structure explicit that you can exploit computationally and that will be very hard to get okay from flat models okay so one of the techniques okay actually that was mentioned by Ute at the beginning of uh, the presentation about the idea of doing uh, classical planning with heuristic search with heuristics extracted from the plural representation but this plural representation is a compact one okay so you cannot derive heuristics in the same way if somebody will give you uh, a flat representation of the state model, okay? So these are basically two main purposes. Uh, on the other hand, it is seldom noticed that these languages provide a handle on, on the problems that we want to address in learning have to do with generalization, transfer, and reuse. These languages were developed with these goals in mind to be used by humans, okay? But of course, they're gonna be very useful as a target language for, for learning representations. And we go, and con I'm considering particularly a couple of these uh, languages. So um, actually one of the languages that is slowly making it, in, I would say, into mainstream machine learning these days is the language of, of structured causal models. As causality is thought to be in some sense the missing piece uh, these days in, in, in deep learning. Um, and a structural causal models of the language is basically the language of, of Bayesian networks. So a structural causal model is like a deterministic Bayesian network, but the only probabilities are on the, the priors. These are the uh, root, variables okay if you want in the network but the big difference is that what uh, the probabilities and uh, and the graph in a Bayesian network represent represent just one probability distribution in the case of the structural causal models so they represent many distributions and the reason is because in a structural causal models you can accommodate interventions you can do actions that set the values of certain variables or get to specific values and in that way, you get new distributions. And all these distributions are characterized, are characterized by mutilation, basically, of the original network associated with the, um, with the causal model. So the queries that are supported in this, uh, in the language of the structural causal models so can distinguish observations, interventions, and counterfactuals. Okay, so the queries about this, so can take a look at the, uh, Nice, uh, a nicely written book, uh, The Book of Why by, by uh, Judah Pearl and David McKenzie, or the previous book on causality. So, actually, there is an exponential number of queries that can be answered, okay, given uh, a, a structural cause of models or even a Bayesian network. Uh, that means that basically these models support an exponential number of potentially testable predictions corresponding to each one of the queries that can be answered. So in a certain way, so learning 
the structural causal models, in particular, when you have the variables of the model, is about learning the simplest model that is compatible with the observed predictions. And in certain cases, okay, that what is done is by computing sort of the independences, okay, so the testable predictions are okay, restricted to independence statement. And in some sense, you want the most compact model, okay, that can account, okay, for this pattern of, of independences. There is another language, okay, that actually is older, but it's not used in, in machine learning, although uh, I assume that many of you are very familiar because it uh, belongs to AI textbooks and is uh, so-called plan interaction languages, okay, that are pretty old, okay, in the new version as supported by Strips and PDDL and so on, so the planning problems are specified in two parts. One part is completely generic, okay? It's the domain that is basically action schemas. And the other part is basically about a particular instance that says, okay, what are the objects in this particular instance? What is the initial situation and what is the goal? So the schemas take the form as, as shown in this um, peak. Uh, action schema, okay, so the schemas take a number of arguments, in this case, okay, the object that you want to pick and the cell location, okay, where you assume that this object is, you have preconditions and you have effects expressed all in a, a very tiny fragment of a, a first order language where you have relations and you have variables that have to be replaced by uh, the objects, okay? I tend to think that most of us are familiar with what probably, uh, again, so uh, it's not so much realized is that there is an important analogy between the language of the structure of causal models and this type of planning language and many other languages as well, in the sense that while well, in structural causal models, okay, you have that the causal relations, okay, capture what is invariant, okay, about the actions, okay, in the different distributions, uh, in the case of the action schemas, it's exactly the same thing. So it's the first order version, and they basically provide a compact encoding of the effect of the actions in each state. Okay, so in other words, if one is looking for the reusable pieces, okay, that do not change, okay, from state to state, from distribution to distribution, one should be learning, okay, these pieces, okay, the causal relations, and in particular in the language of structure causal models and action schemas. In what you care is about doing planning, okay, by uh, assuming, for instance, in this case, that the effect of the actions is deterministic and so on. So, in other words, so these are the reusable pieces that one would like to learn. Of course, there are many other languages supporting these models, and every language, in some sense, provides a compact representation of these models will be a good target for learning as well. Actually, in the case of, of uh, this type of planning language, the number of potentially testable prediction is super exponential because it's exponential when you're given a number of objects, but this number of objects in principle is given by the instance. So when you learn the schema, so they apply to any number of objects uh, at all. Okay, so uh, summarizing this, uh, this part of it, okay, so what are the potential benefits of, of learning language-based representation? So as I said, so uh, one thing is generalization because you are in some sense carving the environment uh, at the true joints. You also get transparency because you're learning uh, representations of a language whose semantics uh, you know. It doesn't mean that the representation that you learn are very easy to interpret, but at least you know the semantics of this representation. And of course you can use this semantics to do inference as well. So given the huge number of potentially testable predictions, okay, so uh, you need less samples, again, less time to learn. And last but not least, okay, these compact representations of these languages provide a very meaningful and, and powerful inductive bias, okay? So while in the case of deep learning, the notion of deep of, of what is a good inductive bias is informal. In the case of this language-based representation, it's something that is very crisp, okay? All you have to do in some sense is to learn the most compact representation in these languages that are compatible with the, the data. In the case of Bayesian networks and a structural causal model, so the compactness, the fact that you can give a specifications that uh, define uh, models that are exponential in size and number of variables is 
basically sparse graphs. In the case of planning, it is idea of action schemas, okay, that that invariant can apply to any state and uh, uh, any number of objects, okay. So once again, so the idea of learning representation based learning on, in, in languages. This, we are not talking about learning in languages that reflect background knowledge. We are talking about languages as these solvers use, okay, that the language themselves are domain independent. It is the representations that we either write by hand in these languages or that we learn that will reflect the particular domain, okay, that we have in mind. Okay, so how does this intersect, okay, many of the themes that we see in uh, inductive logic program, neurosymbolic, uh, um, AI, um, 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 statistical, okay, relational AI models, uh, inductive programming, and so on. I'm gonna, not going to make a, a big list of specific works, but of course that language-based representations are a key, okay, in all these fields, okay. The only distinction I will say is that normally the use of languages uh, come in most of these settings combined with other considerations, okay? Sometimes the language is used to express uh, explicit background knowledge. Sometimes the language, okay, themselves uh, convey implicit background knowledge, okay, because the language is domain dependent. Uh, in some areas, okay, uh, so there is also a commitment uh, to certain computational methods as, as well as probably it was in ILP, okay, many years ago. So from a methodological point of view of nothing against that, if you have an application, uh, definitely you want to use all the knowledge that you have and the use of languages, okay, in some sense, offer you this possibility that you want to exploit. Uh, from uh, the point of view of, of methodology, however, to study the learning problem, I think it's useful okay, to leave uh, explicit or implicit background knowledge aside and try to learn representations in domain independent languages. Domain independent languages, they also made certain implicit assumptions about the world. So if you're talking about a relational language, okay, that supports objects and relations uh, as a target language. So in some sense, that's a commitment, okay, that the world is made of objects, but these are very general, genetic com commitments that are not about a particular domain. So the point is, if, uh, if one leaves the uh, um, implicit or explicit background knowledge aside, one gets as a result, a crisp learning problem and a clear separation of what is to be learned from how it's to be learned. So we can try to learn, okay, representation of action schemas of structural causal models. This can be done either with deep learning or with combinatorial optimization. I'll talk a little bit, okay, in the minutes, okay, that I have left. About the languages themselves, okay, in many cases, you can take the language off the shelf. These are languages that have been designed already, okay, but in other cases, I will see. So you have, in some sense, to, to design the languages yourself, okay, for the functionality that you want and expressivity without meaning that it, the language is going to be uh, domain independent. So in the time that I have left, what I like to do is to uh, be a bit more technical and specific about three particular learning problems okay, that arise when you take this idea of learning language, uh, language-based representations in the setting of actions and planning. Okay, so uh, one is going to be the problem of learning in general dynamics that, as we mentioned before, is basically the problem of learning the predicates and learning the action schemas that use these predicates. The second is about learning general policies. That's normally what uh, deep learning approaches are trying to do. Okay, so you want to learn a policy that you can apply, and if you change the number of objects, you change the configuration of objects, you want this policy, okay, to be still applicable. So in some sense, you don't want um, a policy that is tied to a specific uh, unique state space. Um, the last problem, okay, normally you don't hear much about, okay, although the idea of problem decomposition is pretty old in AI, uh, and it's about languages and learning representations about uh, uh, general sub goal structure. So in the case of mini grid, as I mentioned, there is a clear sub goal structure in the problem, okay, so you need keys in order to open locks, you need to open locks in order, okay, to get to doors, and this basically is not a policy, it's just some structure, okay, about the sub goals in the domain. Okay, this is also a problem that is very important these days in deep reinforcement learning, although they are 
address okay uh, in a different language normally under the idea of learning intrinsic rewards okay so that you can do reinforcement learning quicker okay on a family of, of problems talking about whether the language have to be designed or so on. So in the first case, okay, the language is basically taken off the shelf. In the second and third cases, okay, so we'll talk about design languages. Okay, so let's get going. Okay, this is going to be a bit fast. Okay, and the idea is to give some technical context, okay, to the general ideas about learning these uh, language-based representations. So uh, to learn general dynamics, okay, we consider the following problem. Um, so we have representations like PDDL or strips, first order, meaning that you have schemas, okay, where the schemas get instantiated with the objects, so you have planning problems, and every planning problem, okay, given by a domain and the instance information defines a graph, okay, that is basically the space structure of, of the problem. So the learning problem, learning representation, okay, for, for the planning problem can be cast as an inverse problem. So uh, we are given a number of graphs that reflect the, that the structure of the state space of a number of instances, okay, with no symbolic information at all. And we want to find, so what is the simplest, uh, what are the simplest, uh, what is the simplest domain, okay, that give rise to a, a number of instances such as the graph defined by these instances of this simplest domain matches, uh, in some sense, the uh, given graphs okay so once that the number of objects predicates and schemes and so on so if you bound them the problem becomes a combinatorial optimization problem and we have addressed this problem uh, actually a couple of years ago with with the apply and more recently we have addressed this problem okay uh, in uh, using asp okay what well, basically the inputs that you take okay like here so here actually is the, the it's a very simple example. So the input to this learning uh, algorithm is one or more um, state graphs of this form. Okay, so this is the state graph corresponding to Tower of Hanoi. Okay, and you are supposed to take one or more of these graphs. Okay, dependent on number of disks and number of pegs, and to come up with a genetic representation of the dynamics of the domain that will be useful. Okay, for any number of disks and pegs. Okay, and this is what's basically done. So. Why does this work? Well, it works because basically all the simplest hypotheses, all the simplest domain that you may come up in some sense will not match, okay, with these graphs. By the way, of course, so when, when I talk about these things, there are questions about what happens when you have missing edge, when you have noise and so on. So there is some follow-up work, okay, that take on this idea, uh, basic sort of crystal idea of learning representations in the case where you have uh, sort of noisy input graphs or incomplete graphs as, as the inputs have as well. Okay, so that's one of the problems, okay? And again, so it's a very crisp formulation. So given the graph, so give me the most compact planning representation in these uh, lifted languages, okay, that can account for these graphs in the output. Okay, in that case, we use a language that is off the shelf, so basically lifted strips or, or some simple version of PDLs. Uh, uh, in, in, in this case, what we want to learn is a general policy. So a general policy, as I mentioned, is a policy, let's say, so the policy to solve any instance of the blocks world will be a general policy. It's a strategy that will work no matter the number of configuration of blocks, okay? So uh, in this case, the problem can be cast as given the domain. So now I have learned the domain or somebody gave me the domain. So I have some instance of the domain, okay? Some samples of, of these problems. So I want to find the simplest policy over features that can be derived from the domain predicates such that the police will solve all these given instances. Once again, we are looking for the simplest representation and the language that we use to express these general policies is critical. In this case, we cannot take any language off the shelf, okay, because this problem has not been well studied, even though Uta mentioned at the beginning that some people have been studying this problem for almost 20 years. So in our case, so the policies are expressed by rules over features, okay, that can be derived from these domain uh, predicates. So this derivation is done through a fixed grammar that is basically a description logic grammar uh, and a max number of, of rule applications. So once that you go this way, you can express and address the problem computationally as a combinatorial optimization problem 
more interested, okay, so in, in uh, recent months, okay, we have done some other work where we exploit a, a relation had been established, okay, in the last couple of years between description logics or more general, what's called C2 logics, okay, that basically these are the fragment of, uh, the decidable fragment of first order logic when you only have two variables and, and counting. And there are some very interesting results that relate the expressive power of graph neural networks and these logics, that is the logics underlying, okay, uh, our features. So we managed, okay, to do, address the same computational problem okay directly using graph neural network okay the last uh actually so here is an example of a general policy actually it's a bit simpler than the problem i mentioned about the mini grid so this is about so again you have a grid you have a number of packages in the grid and the agent is supposed to pick up the packages in the grid one by one and take them to some target cell Okay, so uh, the language that is used uh, as a target language for learning these policies is, is shown here through these rules. Uh, and H, uh, P, and T, all these letters that appear here basically denote features. Okay, some of them are Boolean features, they only take two values. Some of them are numerical features and take values in the non negative integers. So, for instance, the first rule, what it's saying is we are not holding a package and you are away from the nearest package, then decrease the distance, okay, to the nearest package, no matter what's the effect on the uh, distance to the target destination, okay? So the features in these rules are learned uh, along with the policy. So you learn the two things together from the space of features defined by this C2 logic or this uh, fixed description logic grammar. Okay, and uh, once that you get this policy, okay, so you can actually prove that this policy will be correct, no matter the size of the grid, no matter so they, where the packages are, no matter the um, number of packages. So it's a general policy in, in that sense. Okay, the last learning problem, okay, that um, Tal tried to mention, so it's about learning uh, the general sub goal structure. As I mentioned, the problem learning sub goal structure is important not only in planning, okay, it's increasingly important in reinforcement learning, in particular in settings where rewards are as sparse. Um, there is actually um, one very interesting paper in uh, ISML uh, last year, what intrinsic rewards capture. And the answer in short to that question that is not actually the answer that you get in that paper that you'll get from this perspective is what, what intrinsic rewards capture is actually the common sub goal structure of the domain, okay? So for instance, in the case of this delivery program that was mentioned before, so the idea that you have to pick a package and deliver them and that there are no more packages, okay? This is uh, the sub goal structure of the problem. It's not a policy, okay? Because it's not telling you how to move at all. Is just describing in some sense what are the sub goals that you have to achieve, and in some sense, some of the order. The interesting thing is again that there has not been a good language to express these sub goal structures. So, people in planning for many years have used and are used in practice, okay, hierarchical task networks, but that's not a specific language to express um, common sub goal structure. On the other hand, the language I was mentioning before to talk about general policies can be used with a slightly change in the semantics, okay, to describe um, these generic sub goal structures. So this sub goal structure that I was talking about before can be captured by these two rules. If you're not holding something, okay, just get to a state where you're holding something. And if you are holding something, get to a state where you are not holding something and the number of packages to be delivered, okay, decreases, okay, by, by one, okay? So these two rules do not capture a policy because I'm not telling you how to move, but they are capturing exactly the structure of the problems. And in the language, okay, I don't have to elaborate, basically they partition the problem in sub problems each of one, okay, can be solved, has a bounded width, as people say these days in planning, and can be solved polynomially. So in some sense, this language cuts uh, the problems into polynomial pieces, okay, that can be solved um, quite exactly. And the language, okay, associated with them is, is this notion of sketches, okay, there are a couple of papers you can uh, take a further look at this. Okay, so uh, 
Okay, so I think I've made a good job since I have to uh, recover the five minutes I lost at the beginning. So uh, let me summarize a little bit and say, so deep learning and deep reinforcement learning are, are great, okay, but they experience limitations, in particular the problem of structure or out of distribution generalization. So what I'm advocating here is for learning language-based representation over domain independent languages, okay? They have a number of potential benefits and um, I've tried to illustrate this, okay? With three particular case studies about learning general dynamics, general policies and general sub -goal structures. Given that we have a sort of distinction between the what we want to learn versus how, okay, so we are now moving a little bit to deep learning as well. And of course, that's something that we want to do is to consider different type of inputs in the problem about the graphs. So the states were black box states. We were not using any inner structure of the states. In other cases, we want to use some being images or being images that already passed and so on. Okay, so with this I finish. Okay, so there is a message in red at the bottom. Okay, those interested. Okay, so uh, let me know. Okay, thank you uh, for hanging there. Okay, thank you. Good day.